share my let me share my screen and there we go. So thank you all for taking time to, to join us as part of your Monday. And I see that there is already a hand raised. So <laughs> if someone needs assistance or if something is not working, let us know. Um, so today I'm going to share with you insights from behavioral science and how they can be used to design more effective energy policy. And a large part of the focus here is more on consumer facing policies. Um, as Jenny kind of hinted at in the in the introduction, I am a psychologist by training and I use different fields of psychology to understand how people might respond to policies or programs. So I draw on cognitive psychology, which is largely about how people perceive and interpret information. It's really helpful for understanding why people may not receive information we provide in the way we intended to them to. I also draw on social psychology, which is broadly about how people are influenced by the behavior of others, particularly uh, people who are in their same groups or who are, are like them in some way. And then the field that I most identify with is environmental psychology, which is broadly about how people are influenced and interact with the settings or environments that they, that they are in. Uh, and as Jenny already said, I use this psychological lens primarily to understand climate and energy issues. So understanding why some people perceive climate change as an urgent threat and others just don't really feel very motivated by it, or understanding what leads to acceptance or opposition to, uh, let's say, large scale energy developments like wind farms or perhaps hydraulic fracturing. I also look at, oops, at how people behave within their day to day lives. Early in my career, I focused on understanding sort of everyday habitual behaviors. How do you get people to adjust their thermostat to use less energy? or to take public transit instead of a personal vehicle. But in the last decade or so, I've really shifted to looking at what I call high impact energy investments, all these pictures at the bottom of this slide. Uh, so what leads people to put solar on their roof or to buy the, the Energy Star efficient appliance instead of the less efficient one, or what might compel someone to invest in an electric vehicle? Um, and really, a lot of these bottom behaviors are increasingly becoming a focus within energy policy. Um, as a touch point for today, I thought I would focus on the US Inflation Reduction Act, which if you're not familiar with, this was just passed this past fall. It is actually a huge act with many different provisions. I'm going to focus on more of the, the public consumer facing parts of the act which includes rebates for people to weatherize their homes or to invest in heat pump technology. Um, heat pumps can be used for heating and cooling, but there are also heat pump water heaters and heat pump clothes dryers. Um, the act also includes provisions to encourage people to shift towards electrification. Uh, we know that the, the ultimate goal is to green the electricity grid with renewable energies, which means we need to get people using electricity uh, as their main energy source instead of oil or natural gas. Uh, the act also includes and extends some tax credits for electric vehicles and solar panels. So this sounds great, and I will say that I'm very excited about this as someone who is in the energy space, but there's a question of what can we expect uh, from these types of policies, these types of incentives. Um, and just, I won't go through all of this, but just to give you a sense of how big some of these incentives are, um, it, they're not insignificant. Seven and a half thousand dollars for a new electric vehicle, uh, $4,000 to install a new electric panel for your home, $2,000 for a heat pump. In some cases, depending on income qualifications, these entirely cover the cost of the technology, especially on the right side for the rebates. However, 
We know from past research that just because an incentive is out there doesn't mean that people will use it and how well they work depends greatly on how they are implemented. So we have had in the US a federal weatherization program going back to the 1980s and this was something that provided lower income households money, you know, to insulate their homes to use draft proofing to make their homes more comfortable and to not waste energy. And the evidence from there is that even though the financial incentives were identical, their uptake uh, varied tenfold or more across different communities because they had different strategies for marketing those incentives uh, and getting people interested. And in the US, we often have this phrase, oh, if you build it, they will come. It's this reference to an old movie, Field of Dreams. And this is sort of a theme that I often use in my classes that it's not the case that if we build it, they will come. It really depends on how we market that incentive, how we design programs to make it easier for them to use. So. That's kind of the perspective I'm going to take here of understanding today why having an incentive isn't enough and what we can do to try to make uh, participation in these types of programs more appealing. And just to kind of put a finer point on this, a lot of traditional policy approaches assume they kind of take that if you build it, they will come mentality that if we just provide the technology, people will want to use it and the benefits of it will be self evident. If that's not the case, then the, the next assumption is well, we just need to educate people and provide them information and then they will rationally decide, oh yes, I should invest in this technology or do this behavior. And if that fails, then we might think about offering money to motivate them. And what I will show you in the next several slides is that often this isn't enough, that there are other motivations that we need to try to tap as well. So a lot of the courses that I teach at Harris are sort of making this argument that traditional policy can get us most of the way, but we need to think about that last final step of once we have a policy or program in place, how do we make it attractive to people? And that's where behavioral science can be really helpful. So I'm going to structure this around sort of explaining some of the challenges that we might expect with the Inflation Reduction Act of why wouldn't people be motivated to take advantage of these huge incentives and then describe to you some opportunities or possible strategies that we can use from behavioral science to try to make these programs more successful. So on the challenge side, a lot of what I'm going to show you here is really about motivation and that often the folks who are designing energy policies and programs misunderstand the public's motivations. Part of this has to do with expertise, that those of us working in the energy field, we nerd out on energy and we kind of have this tendency to assume that others do as well. And we really don't understand that people don't relate to energy the same way that we do. And importantly, People misunderstand energy use. We know from research that if you ask people, for example, what are the most effective things you can do to address climate change, they will focus on things like recycling or turning off lights. And these are behaviors that are very salient, meaning that people are aware of them. They see themselves turning the lights on and off. They've gotten a lot of exposure maybe to environmental campaigns about turning off lights and recycling is more of a cultural norm. People tend to underestimate how much energy is used by large appliances in their homes. So this is a graph and I realize it's really complicated. It's from a what's now a famous study from 13 years ago trying to get people to estimate the energy use of uh, different types of goods in their homes. And the y-axis here is watt hours of energy use. And what you can see is that everything is really compressed or right around 100 watt hours, um, meaning that people don't think a dishwasher uses that much more energy than a regular old incandescent light bulb. 
the, the 45 degree angle line is actually where those behaviors fall. And this is showing us that people just don't understand that, yeah, actually your, your refrigerator, your air conditioner, your dishwasher, your dryer, all use way more energy than things like the light bulbs in your home. So right there, there's a problem of people may not even understand the, the benefits of investing in these energy efficiency technologies or renewable energy because it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. And one of the ways that maybe we try to correct for this is that we provide people information. Information disclosure is a common policy tool and even our utilities, right? We get energy bills telling us how much electricity or natural gas or oil we're using. The problem here is that for a lot of people, these come maybe once a month. A lot of people never even look at them. It's on auto pay. <laughs> um, and there's a big disconnect between getting this feedback and when behaviors were performed. You can't look at your bill and understand what you were doing in your home that led to this energy consumption. So it's hard for people to know what they should prioritize. We have energy labels. Uh, you know, if someone needs to buy a new refrigerator or an appliance or a new car, we have labels that are mandated to help people understand, but the research kind of shows these labels are poorly understood. And the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of other factors that compete for attention when people are deciding what to do. We don't really think about electricity for the sake of electricity. We think about electricity and other energy for the services it provides. Like, Many of you may have watched the Super Bowl yesterday and you were using energy to enjoy a game. You weren't thinking about what are the emissions from watching this on my big screen TV. Same thing with our cars. We tend to, not, we might notice the price at the pump, but otherwise we're thinking about our cars as a means to get from here to there. And a lot of our energy use is about comfort and uh, making our homes more comfortable. Uh, I like to bring these examples up from when Trump was president. Uh, he would complain about low flow shower heads that he couldn't get the shampoo out of his hair. And there was also a group complaining that efficient dishwashers took too long when they wanted to make dishwashers great again. And I give these examples just to say that you know, there, there are folks who, they don't just care about energy, they care about how their appliances work and those factors may matter more. And I will say that even as someone who has been in the energy space for a long time, these other factors can override your decision making. I had uh, to buy new kitchen appliances and I previously in my career had literally written consumer tips on how to find the most efficient appliance. So when my husband and I walked into the appliance store, I was very confident, okay, I'm going to get the most energy efficient refrigerator there is. And then you get there and it's like all this shiny stainless steel and there's through the door ice and water makers or do I want it on the inside and look the arrangement of these vegetable bins is different. And you very quickly lose sight of this one factor because the truth is, right, you care about how this appliance functions for you on a day to day basis. Um, another challenge here is that there are a lot of different ways that people can help conserve energy through their choices, but the motivations and barriers to those behaviors differ. So um, curtailment behaviors that I have here on the left side, these are things that are everyday habits. Do you wash your laundry in cold water? Do you adjust your thermostat? What motivates people to do these types of actions, we know from research, is different from what you see on the rest of this slide. So we can often encourage people to adjust their thermostat or use cold water washes through environmental messaging or appealing to people to be pro-social to benefit others. But when you start to look at these behaviors that are more expensive, there's a whole lot of other factors that matter, that they're expensive and they're expensive upfront. 
they may take a while to pay for themselves over time. A lot of these technologies, especially towards the right side of the slide, are new to people. They just don't know that much about them. You may have seen some Super Bowl ads yesterday about electric vehicles, kind of making fun of, uh, you know, uncertainty in whether the, the electric vehicles will have the range that they need. So this is all to say, like, technologies can seem risky and it can be like, okay, you want me to pay a whole lot of extra money right now for what I perceive as an uncertain benefit. Um, and what we know is that like trying to appeal to environmental values is actually less important for these behaviors than really addressing people's concerns. There's also an issue that many of these behaviors have high, what I call hassle factors. So you have to research options. You've got to find contractors. You've got to get permits. You've got to prepare your property. So in the Inflation Reduction Act, we have all of these rebates for heat pump technologies. Well, OK, so that means people need to figure out what a heat pump is, try to figure out who is selling heat pumps, what it would mean to, to install that in their home. And all of that can quickly become a deterrent to taking action. So. My point here is that a lot of times when we have a traditional policy tool like incentives, we don't necessarily take into account all of these other factors that influence people's decision making. And I realize there is a large, I think maybe mostly just a comment in the chat, so I will keep going on. Um, I want to shift to thinking about, okay, <laughs> What are the opportunities then to implement policies more effectively? And I'll start with this challenge that, especially when people are considering an energy investment that has a high upfront cost, we know that they're largely going to be focused on the economics. Um, people have budget constraints. For some, this is just going to be not a possibility. And in a part, that's what incentives are intended to address. If you have studied behavioral science at all, you might be aware of uh, these different mental biases that people have were present biased. So even though, for example, a heat pump water heater will definitely pay for itself in two to three years, people are much more focused on, I want to save the most money now. So they will choose the cheaper model. There's also this idea of loss aversion that a loss feels more painful to us than a, an equivalent gain. It's more painful to lose $40 than the joy we get from getting $40. And here you're asking people for sure to lose more money to pay more for an energy efficient good for a rather uncertain gain that's far into the future. So it kind of combines with present bias. And just in general, we know that people are not very good at thinking about how much energy or the energy cost of different appl appliances are good. So people don't really think about how much money they would save if they choose uh, an electric vehicle or a fuel efficient vehicle compared to a rather inefficient one. So and because of what I was describing before, energy energy as a whole can just seem like a low priority relative to other things of, I want a cool looking car or I want appliances that match the rest of the decor in my house. So what are some things we can do to help overcome this barrier about upfront cost? And there's been a variety of studies. You'll see a commonality here. Hunt Elcott was one of the main researchers in this area for a while of looking at, well, what happens if we try to provide information to people about the total cost over the lifetime of a good? So not just here's the purchase price, but how much does it cost to use this thing over its lifetime? And surprisingly, he has found in studies of light bulbs, water heaters, and fuel efficient vehicles, that there is no effect of disclosing this. So even though you could show people they could save quite a bit of money, it doesn't influence them. So what about the effect of incentives? He did this, he looked at this with his light bulb and water heater study, and he found really small effects. So, um, 
they approached people in Home Depot, it's a big box store for selling home goods while they were buying light bulbs. And they presented them with this information about how they could save money with a CFL or a light bulb. That had no effect, but providing a coupon increased CFL sales by 10% good, but pretty modest. Um, he had another study looking at water heater sales where they offered customers either a $25 rebate or a $100 rebate. That small rebate had no effect. Many of you are thinking, I have no idea what a water heater costs. It's probably somewhere between like $500 to $1,000, depending um, on its features. The bigger rebate did have a modest effect. Um, in the control condition, just under 1% of people picked Energy Star with a $100 rebate that went up by 0.6 to 3.7%. So there's some effect. But what we're getting a, a clue of here is these incentives really have to be large enough for people to, to think that they're worthwhile. And an important revelation we've had from studying different policies is that the design of incentive matters a lot. Um, in economics, there can be a tendency to think that all of the different incentives are equivalent, that a tax credit is the same as a rebate if the dollar value is the same. And what we're learning is that no, the timing of those incentives matter. People would much prefer getting an instant rebate or grant um, than they would a tax credit, which at least in the US, they might have to wait a year for. Um, and that could be even if they end up saving less money overall. People would rather have a, a sales tax waiver uh, for hybrid car purchasing than a tax credit, even though that waiver was smaller. We also know that because upfront costs are such a deterrent, um, that policies and incentives that allow people to spread out those upfront costs make that behavior more appealing. So I've done a lot of research on solar panel adoption and about 10 or 12 years ago, there were federal incentives that basically encouraged a whole new business model where solar installers would install solar on your home but you didn't own it. You were basically renting it. And that meant that instead of having to pay $20,000 up front for solar, you could just pay a monthly fee and still get cheaper electricity. And this has largely been responsible for why there's been an uh, increase in solar in the US. The other thing here, and, and I will say a lot of, uh, state energy offices are doing this in their implementation of incentives. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, another factor here is making sure an incentive is guaranteed. So in the solar space, for example, um, there are feed-in tariffs, which are popular, uh, that's been used in Germany and on Aust in Australia, and it encourages people to adopt early. They get a guaranteed uh, incentive for producing more renewable electricity and it phases out over time and people who adopt later will get less of an incentive. Here in the US we have a very different policy called net metering and that policy has been revoked in certain states and it can make people because it's not guaranteed they can be less certain that they're going to benefit from it. Um, but we can apply the same principle to other types of incentives. Uh, for example, with electric vehicles, many people worry about where am I going to charge my car if I go on a road trip? And so thinking about how do we provide the support of infrastructure, which is also a form of incentive, so that people know for sure that, that they can take advantage of it. So this is all to say that the design of incent incentives is really critical. We can also think about the overall way in which we are encouraging people to take advantage of incentives and the timing of how programs work. So I've already hinted at the idea that uh, it can be a complex decision when you are making investments for your home. 
And if you think about when people are most likely to think about buying new appliances or making a big renovation to their home, like putting solar panels or getting a new car, it's usually when the old thing that they already have breaks or they've had some major life change. They're moving homes, they're changing jobs, they're already renovating for some other reason. And so there is an opportunity um, to make changes without it being more of an inconvenience. Now we can think about the Inflation Reduction Act. Well, what if we just suddenly provide an incentive? Does this motivate people to change their behavior? It can, although most likely it's most effective for people who were already considering something and just wasn't affordable for them. It's not clear that these types of incentives are particularly great at attracting new people who had never considered a technology. And I think what's least likely is that someone just wakes up one morning and <laughs> decides, oh, today's the day that I'm going to just overhaul my energy consumption and go buy, you know, all Energy Star appliances and a Tesla. Really unlikely, right? So we need to be thinking about how do we approach people at these common points of your appliance broke or you're moving. These are what we sometimes call um, like policy windows of opportunity, that they're prime times for people to actually consider what you have, what you are offering. The challenge here, though, is these are also stressful times. Um, you know, moving is a very stressful time and you've just spent a lot of money on a new rent or buying a home. If something breaks, you just want it fixed right away. It's super inconvenient to not have hot water or a functioning dishwasher or no refrigerator. And so these are very time constrained moments where people may not be willing to put in the effort to do research. So we need to think about how do we design policies and how do we implement them in a way that makes it as easy as possible for people to make the low carbon choice in that moment. So I like to give this example, this is from a, a small study done in the UK, where they had um, what they call grants, an incentive to encourage people to insulate the attics of their home. And this grant program existed. There was some uptake, but it was not as high as they wanted it to be. So they designed this experiment where the control condition was we're going to continue to offer this grant. That's the control condition. There's nothing else. They had another condition where they targeted neighbors and said, we will give you an additional discount if a whole bunch of your neighbors sign up together. And I'll talk about this a little later, but this is trying to leverage sort of this feeling of social pressure. And then the last group um, you still could get the grant for the insulation, but they would offer for a fee, meaning people had to pay for this, a service where that someone would come and clean out all the junk from your attic so that it would be easier to insulate. Now, they had good reason to think that this neighborhood idea would be successful. It actually had no impact. And what actually really mattered was that people needed help getting all the junk out of their attic and they were happy to pay for it. And I like this example because it really emphasizes just how much these hassle factors stop people from taking advantage of incentives that are out there for things that they actually would like to do. So we need to think more about how do we cater programs to people's needs that we need to shift away from focusing purely on do this for the sake of saving energy or for addressing climate change and more for how do these goods help or services increase comfort in someone's home or appeal to their concerns about having a healthy home or making their home look more attractive. For some goods like a Tesla, there's also a social status benefit that some people perceive and in some cases different energy services increase the safety of one's home. Um, in fact, I, I just heard a commercial in Chicago uh, advertising attic insulation to prevent pipes from freezing and really hitting home on sort of a safety uh, angle. 
We also, though, have to think about how to simplify the process. People are already overwhelmed. And we need to think about ways to minimize how much paperwork they have to do or how difficult it is to comparison shop. One of the things we know from behavioral science is that if there are too many choices, people feel overwhelmed and they just won't do anything. And this is something that in particular I'm concerned about with the Inflation Reduction Act because the rules and um, eligibility criteria for the different incentives are very complex. And for people to try to sort that out is going to be challenging. So we're gonna need a lot of sort of community partners who can make that easier for people. Um, and along with that, when you're talking about changes to a home, thinking about how do you identify contractors or companies that are known to do high quality work, which can reduce some of that risk that I talked about earlier. And then thinking about how do we do this to match with those moments of time of, oh, your appliance just broke or you're moving homes. How do we design policies to really align with those moments? And this relates also to thinking about who are the right people to sort of be the messengers. Um, so I think this is an area that has largely been overlooked in the policy realm of thinking about people who are sort of at the point of sale. So if we know that people tend to shop for new appliances or new cars when the old one is breaking or not running reliably, their first point of contact may be the, the salesperson. Um, and I can say that often these folks are not motivated to focus on uh, options that use less energy. They're thinking about making a sale, which is often about finding the lower cost good that meets the customer's needs. So there are a variety of people who could serve this role from car salespeople to home improvement contractors to real estate agents to salespeople for appliances. Um, but they also then have to be equipped with the right information, meaning policies need to target them to make sure that they are delivering correct information and also helping increase awareness about incentives that are available. There's not a whole lot of research that's been done so far on these types of folks. What we have learned is that they often have inaccurate information even at certified car dealerships for electric vehicles, up to a third of car sales associates have inaccurate information about the subsidies that are available. And they were not necessarily inclined to bring up EVs unless a customer brought it up themselves. I will point out the study is from 2017. There's been another study done a year or two later in Europe that was similar. This might be changing since EVs are just gaining more attention in general in the media, but it's still a concern that they may not be a good source of information for folks. We've also seen that even when people are trained uh, to talk about energy efficiency, they will tend to revert back to old habits and old sales practices. So there needs to be sort of an application of behavioral science in thinking about how to help retailers do a better job of selling these products to customers. So to give you kind of a, a quick example, I mentioned the study earlier with water heaters. Uh, and what they were doing is they were if, if you look at this matrix, they were comparing two different strategies to try to encourage people to choose an Energy Star efficient water heater. They varied yes, no, do we mention Energy Star in the sales pitch? And then they varied, do we offer an incentive? So the control group didn't get anything. There was a $25 rebate or a $100 rebate. They additionally had two conditions where the sales agent was offered a $25 bonus. And this actually was a huge incentive relative to their normal commission. And so they added these on to the conditions where the customer either got a $25 rebate or a $100 rebate. So what they found, dishearteningly, only 20% 
of the sales agents even complied with delivering this Energy Star information. So they didn't want to try to sell this. So that's a little disheartening. Um, providing this information about Energy Star had no effect. Now, if we think about the rebates, I already showed you these numbers. Um, if the sales agent also got an incentive and the customer was offered a $25 rebate, it had no effect. It, the $25 rebate made no difference to the customers and giving the sales agent an incentive on top of that made no difference. In the condition where customers got a $100 rebate, which we already saw had some improvement, giving the, the um, sales agent an additional $25 incentive dramatically increased the effectiveness of that. So this is all to say that maybe we also need to think about incentivizing the retailers uh, to focus on these types of efficient behaviors. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is that policies sometimes treat the public as one big homogenous group. <laughs> And when you're talking about new technologies, what we know from a lot of different research is that the people who are willing to adopt early on are very different from the people who adopt later on. And if we only study effects on average, we're going to miss out on understanding what we could do better uh, to attract different adopters. Um, this is something that has come up. We've seen evidence of this in a variety of different um, fields. I've done work on this looking at solar adoption, but it also shows up uh, for understanding alternative fuel vehicles. And this is all rooted in something we call diffusion of innovations theory, which describes how innovation spread through society. And I already said who adopts earliest is different from who adopts later. An example I love to give is to think about who are the people who lined up overnight at Apple stores to buy the first ever iPhone when we didn't really understand what iPhones were. Those are early adopters. And then there are people who are like my grandmother who we forced her to get a smartphone in the last year because she absolutely did not want to deal with the hassle of it. So her motivations and barriers to adopting that technology are very different from the person who is willing to spend a thousand bucks and not even know exactly what they were getting. So when we think about these earliest adopters, they are going to be people who just they like new and novel technology. They think technology is cool. For energy technologies, they tend to also be pro-environmental, but that's not necessarily true. Certainly not all Tesla adopters are pro-environmental. Some of them just like the technology because it's cool. These folks are also not as risk averse. Um, and some of these early adopters can kind of act as opinion leaders who will then influence others. So when we get to people like my grandmother or even maybe parents who were kind of slow to adopt smartphones, these people who adopt later are looking more to others. Like, is this technology working out? Um, they are more risk averse and they really wanna see evidence that this is gonna pay off. Um, and then you know, the, the laggards like my grandmother, these are people who have to adopt because their old technology is just not gonna work anymore. So what does it mean to try to target these customers? It means that the way we sort of market different policies or incentives may vary depending on what stage we're in. So Inflation Reduction Act has a lot of incentives around heat pumps and electrification, and that is not something that is going to have mainstream appeal, I predict, for quite a while. But it might mean then at a local and state level where we're thinking about implementing these incentives, you're trying to target people to help them understand why this technology is so novel or how they can be kind of the first cool house on the block that has a heat pump. Um, as we move to later stages of adoption, it becomes more important 
to focus on social proof, improving that others are using this technology successfully. Can they see that it is being adopted by others? That's something with solar that's very easy. And Tesla, you can see more EVs being on the road. It's also the case that it helps people if they can talk to others to learn uh, about the technology and sort of assuage the concerns they have. And I'll just say here, Solarize in the US is a great example of this, of getting groups of people to sign up at the same time to bid it, get a group discount. And there, it can kind of lessen the perceived risk when you see that others are doing this at the same time. Okay. And this is, yeah, sorry. No, 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 it's okay. We just had two questions that came in about the previous sure. study, study. And so I just wanted to highlight those. Um, Kunal was asking if the customers knew about the salesperson getting the incentive. And Anthony was asking, do you think the attitude played a big role in the Energy Star um, policy on the side of the customer and the sales agent? Yeah, so to my knowledge, customers did not know that the sales agents were getting an incentive. I'm fairly certain of that. And then as far as do I think attitude played a big role, it's hard to know. Like, do did people have a positive attitude towards Energy Star? Um, I would say on the sales agent side, there may have been an attitude of, I know that this is not what customers care about, so this is going to hurt my chances of making a sale if I bring this up. So I think, yes, that is an important part of this. On the customer side, it's hard to know how to think about attitudes there. They might think the Energy Star is a good thing, but it's competing with another attitude of, I don't want to spend a lot of money right in this moment, and especially for this good that I probably need because my current one is breaking. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. And thanks for, for letting me know those were there. Um, just to finish up this slide, um, these later adopters, these are the people for which it's going to be really important to give people assurances of the quality that they're going to get. So for example, in the solar space, many states when they are implementing various incentives, they will require solar installers to meet some minimum level of performance so that people can be assured, yes, the solar panels I am attaching to my most expensive investment, my home, are actually going to produce the amount of energy that you're saying, and I can expect at least some minimum level of uh, income from that if I'm in a state with, with net metering. Um, and I'll just say here that in general, we know that social influence is really important. Um, social norms research is sort of one of the darlings of behavioral scientists. And some of you may have heard about or received these yourselves. Um, these are home energy reports that compare your energy consumption to your efficient neighbors. So in this case, uh, it's showing you that you're performing really well, better than others. Uh, for others, they may learn that they're, they're using more energy than average. These reports have been around, I want to say, since about 2008, and they have been very successful at getting people to conserve energy in their homes. And what we're learning is that in general, as people learn what others are doing in the energy space, it influences their behavior. We're not exactly sure how to best harness this yet, but we do know that when people can see that others have adopted solar, it increases the likelihood that they will as well. Um, and the same is true for a lot of hybrids and electric vehicles. So um, there's research out of California showing that in neighborhoods that have more solar panels, they are more likely to have the next solar panel installation than neighborhoods that have fewer of them. There's evidence that when people can talk to others who have solar, it shortens how long they take to decide whether they themselves should adopt. Um, and I've done research showing that when people can see that others have adopted a technology, it reduces the perceived risk of that. So we call all of what I've described here a passive peer effect. It's based on what you can see. Um, and then there's also 
active peer effects where you're actually talking to others. Um, this sort of word of mouth, positive word of mouth, can be really beneficial. There is, though, the potential for things to go the wrong direction. I like to think of compact fluorescent light bulbs. The curly Q light bulbs is a good example of this. The early ones were pretty ugly and they could break. And a lot of people didn't end up liking them and they were expensive. And that created a lot of negative word of mouth about those bulbs that may have discouraged others from adopting them as well. So anyway, the, the big picture takeaway of thinking about social influence is also thinking about how we design programs in a way where we can highlight that more and more people are doing something because that can do a lot to assuage concerns um, and i'm seeing uh, a question about sharing the list of papers i can create that and for the study on clearing the attic to install solar panels um, <laughs> the researchers identified a key psychological pain point, but most times researchers are clueless about what pain points are preventing adoption. What could be ways to identify these pain points? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I would say in general, like this is also a space where just behavioral science is needed, that there are folks that really can't look beyond, well, we just need to provide information and incentives so they don't even think in this space. There is something called community-based social marketing, which as part of its process, you go in and try to identify what those pain points are and you design the intervention to address them. And that is generally how behavioral science consulting firms work, is they do that research and that homework of doing surveys, doing ethnographic interviews in people's homes, trying to understand what is so challenging about this behavior so that they can make sure to target the intervention in the correct direction. Um, and then there's a comment about it seems important to message the benefits to the consumer. Um, have has there been any research comparing this tactic to a messaging campaign around collective benefit? Um, this is a tricky space, this sort of what is the personal benefit versus the collective benefit. Um, I think when you were talking about energy investments where the economics are going to dominate that decision for many people, it can be hard to take into consideration these broader environmental benefits. And for some people, those broader environmental benefits are not going to be what attracts them to doing the behavior. And there's some evidence that it may turn some people off. It's not to say that wholesale, you couldn't think about that, but it really does come down to understanding who the audience is. Um, I like, this is something that, I did not learn really until the last decade of my life, but car uh, manufacturers, for example, have very different car ads depending on where you live in the country. Uh, so they might appeal to more rural customers in a way that's very different than urbanites. And so you can imagine that with targeted campaigning, um, you could appeal to some of these more pro-environmental values but maybe avoid that in other places where that's not going to be the driving motivation. Um, and then there's a question about, can we increase pain points for unsustainable goods or would that be unethical? And yes, someone else is pointing out that that is called sludge. And I think that all just depends on what kind of good you are talking about. Um, Cause some people might still consider the unsustainable one fine for other purposes. Um, that is part of what happens with nudging is you make the undesirable behavior more difficult. Um, the example that's popping to mind is with recycling and compost. Some cities have very small bins for your trash and much bigger bins for your compost and your recycling uh, so that it is harder to just throw everything away. Okay, I think I have caught up on questions. So I will just actually go to, oops, a summary slide and we can open it up more broadly of when we think about energy policy, 
we need to shift away from just assuming that people are going to be self-motivated to invest. They may not understand why renewable energy technologies or efficient technologies have a benefit. They don't understand their energy consumption, and they may perceive it as very risky. Um, we need to be careful in assuming that they just they care about saving money and that that's the only motivation. Uh, social motivations play a role here, risk perceptions play a role, and we need to move away from treating everyone as being the same. So we need to think about how do we design policies and programs to target people at the right time, either what stage of the market is this? Are we talking about the earliest adopters or people later on? But also, when are the opportune times? When are those windows of opportunity when people are moving or already going to go purchase something? We need to think more about the design of incentives. We need to make sure that the information sources are very credible and at the right points of decision. We can think about providing decision support tools to help people kind of balance the different things they care about. I would love nothing more than the next time I go to buy an appliance to have a tool that lets me identify these are the things I care about and then I get shown just the five appliances, you know, that fit that. Because right now we're just expecting people to wade through all kinds of information on their own. And we can think about ways to try to make it social and normalize this. Okay, I will close it there and open it up to broader questions. Professor, I did see one that snuck into the chat right at the end that was asking about some of the incentives for developing countries. And folks, if you have other questions, go ahead and send them to the chat. We tend to get a lot at the end. Yeah, so this is certainly applicable to developing countries as well. Um, I think there's an added challenge in many of those contexts that we sometimes come in with technologies that we assume will solve some problem and that people will want it. Uh, an example that I use in my class is solar cook stoves. Um, there are a lot of communities that rely on firewood to cook their meals, and this can be very unhealthy, especially if it's like a cooking hut where all the smoke and particulate matter is sort of contained. It can also be environmentally damaging as people harvest uh, wood and resources nearby. And so engineers will sometimes come in like, look, you have a lot of sun where you live. Here is a solar cook stove. This will solve all your problems. And it's a great example of how yeah, maybe it solves the health and environmental problem, but it does not pay attention to the things that actually people care about more. And research has shown that there's been resistance to these cook stoves, especially if people don't get them for free. But it also means a disruption to sort of cultural norms that going and gathering firewood was something that women would go do together. Or my favorite anecdote that Going and gathering wood was a time to complain about their husbands with each other. And now if they don't have that, right, you have removed an important part of sort of their, their social culture. Um, so I think these same things apply. And there is research that's being done um, in some countries, for example, getting really tiny little solar panels that allow people to charge a, a cell phone and whatnot trying to understand what leads people to adopt those or not. And some of these same principles apply. Um, and now all the questions are coming in. <laughs> so hold on, I've got to scroll up here. Um, so what is the anticipated net impact of consumer side changes versus industrial? Wouldn't we be better served by targeting public opinion of industrial responsibility. Yeah, it's a great point um, that certainly industry has a huge role here. And I never want to suggest that the onus is just on the end consumer. I tend to think of my role here as sometimes we come up with solutions that are still going to require cooperation of the public. And we need to be mindful of how we approach that. As I said at the very beginning, um, some of the other research I do looks at public opinion of 
large scale energy developments, which is sometimes an energy, an industrial step towards clean energy, but people don't want to have a big wind farm near them or utility scale solar. And so we need to think about still uh, how people perceive those technologies. Um, is there a particular reason why negative nudges, disincentives are not used to boost adoption of healthy behaviors? Um, that is done to some extent. It depends on how you define a negative nudge. I also teach a, a broad behavioral science course for policy where we look at a variety of um, policy areas, not just energy. We look at health and uh, other behaviors. Um, that same idea of trying to make, in this case, the unhealthy behavior harder to do sometimes still applies. The example that comes to mind is making unhealthy food choices less accessible to people um, were not as salient as the healthier ones. One of the challenges with health behaviors and a lot of behaviors is that a lot of them are habitual. So you have to sort of disrupt people's habits and habits are very automatic. They're not something that people are necessarily consciously aware of. So you have to design interventions carefully to keep that in mind. Um, there's a question, how much does the larger narrative affect behavior? If there's a greater acceptance in a country of the need to adopt pro-environmental behaviors. Yeah, I mean, that sort of larger cultural norm certainly plays a role. Um, there are definitely countries that on the whole are more pro-environmental than say the US, where because that's sort of the perceived social norm that this is something we care about, it's gonna be easier uh, to get people to go along with some of those behaviors to a degree. I think you're still going to find a challenge, though, when you're talking about any type of behavior with a big investment or that is very inconvenient, there may still be resistance and there's still a need for trying to make this easier for folks. And do, do I help set up experiments or do I analyze experiments? So I do some experimental work, but also just read up on the other experimental work that folks are doing. Um, and I, ooh, uh, let's see, are there any particular research studies on adoption rates for affordable housing condominiums? That is not an area of research that I'm familiar with. Um, and I wanted to ask how to particularly motivate people to adopt energy efficient, efficient efficiency choices under the current harsh economic situation. Yeah, so that is a great question. And I think I could have done a better job, for example, with the Inflation Reduction Act that because some of those incentives truly are targeted to the lowest income households, it should be the kind of thing where for some folks, it actually doesn't cost them anything. They just need to apply to the program and make the time to have the upgrades made to their home. But one of the things we have learned is that even when things are free, people do not always take them up. It's actually very, we have research out of U Chicago and Berkeley showing that uptake of the federal weatherization program is abysmal <laughs> even though people could get something very free or for at no cost i have done work on um completely subsidized solar adoption among low-income households and there's there are other issues here too about trust that it it sounds too good to be true that you're offering me this great thing um so I think that's a space where community organizations really need to come in and help demonstrate the value of a program and then find others in a community who have already adopted to help demonstrate that this is something that people are benefiting from and it's not that risky. Um, let's see, is there any evidence on whether investment decision of energy saving technologies changes with the gender or age? of the head of the household. Yeah, so um, it's a funny thing. Overall, if you just look at environmental concern, you will find that women are more environmentally concerned than men. But when it comes to adoption of these technologies, it tends to be something that 
men might adopt earlier than women. Age also plays a role. It's not perfectly linear though. Um, much older households tend to not be as interested. Really young households may not have the economic resources and so they put it off. So you sort of see people in the middle uh, being more willing to invest in these technologies. Professor, I think you got them, all of those questions. <laughs> and I know we're at time and I just really want to thank you so much for giving us your time today and, you know, giving students an idea of some of the things that they might think about as policy students. And I want to thank everyone for their questions, but Professor Wolski, we really appreci appreciate your time this morning. Thank well, you so much. Thanks so much for having me and you should come to Harris. There's lots of great things going on here. <laughs> thank you so much. You have a good rest of your week. Same to all of you.